The media followed this event like a war. Racing rivals with everything to gain and everything to lose. It was built in a hurry. There was a lot of crime. Amid a war between North and South, a dream to link East and West. Some people called him Crazy Judah. There were people who thought it was impossible, no doubt. The steel, spikes, and ties that bound America. It seemed crazy. The Transcontinental Railroad. I'm Stuart Varney, and this is American Built. Before the Civil War, the United States was incredibly divided. North and South couldn't see eye to eye, and East and West couldn't see each other at all. From New York, it was easier to get to India than it was to get to California. The journey west was epic. Going over the, the mountains, the Rocky Mountains and the Sierras in a covered wagon in and of itself is dangerous, or fording rivers is dangerous. Try doing that in the winter. You could have taken a steamship to Panama. That route took several weeks, even months, and there was always a danger of, of catching a disease. But sunshine wasn't the only lure of California. There was gold in them there hills. The concept of a transcontinental railroad had been discussed prior to the discovery of gold in California. There was talk, um, but it seemed crazy. When gold was discovered in California, that became a whole different conversation. It would save a lot of people money and would make a lot of people money as well. But deciding to build a railroad is easier than deciding where to build it. If you build it in the north, you have to contend with snow. If you build it in the south, there's a lot of desert down there. And they didn't think they could build across the Sierra Nevada mountains. But an ambitious young engineer went into those mountains looking for a solution. His name, Theodore Judah. Judah was the person who found the route that would get the rail line over the mountain range. Judah's idea was to build a rail line from Sacramento through the Sierra Mountains at the infamous Donner Pass, then across the Platte River Valley and on to Omaha. From there, existing rail lines would connect to the East Coast. It was a good idea, and Theodore Judah was not shy about sharing it. Some people called him Crazy Judah for just how excited he got and how invested he was personally in building the Transcontinental Railroad. Judah set out to sell his big idea coast to coast. Unfortunately, he caught yellow fever in Panama and died before he reached New York. Judah found a way to make the Transcontinental Railroad possible. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see it completed. But crazy Judah's plan lived on. It found a powerful ally in a former Mississippi River boatman headed for DC. President-elect Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln saw the potential of railroads in an optimistic way, right? This technology can unite us. Because we are not really the United States if it takes four to six months to get from one side of the country to the other. But Lincoln knew the southern states would never go for it. So all of the southern senators were not interested in voting for something that would place this railroad in the north and vice versa. The Southern Secession opened the door for Lincoln to push through the Railroad Act. With the Southern senators and congressmen gone, Congress is finally able to agree on something. The question was, how could they get it built quickly? The answer, pay by the mile. So they get about $16,000 a mile for building on the plains, $48,000 a mile for building in the mountains, and they get 12,000 acres of land for every mile of track that they build. It would be the biggest government-funded construction project in history, and the nation desperately needed a common goal. A horrible, grueling, divisive civil war had just happened. And the idea of unity in any form, I think, was powerful. Congress recruited two rival companies and challenged them to race. The two rail companies were the Central Pacific, which was building west to east, and Union Pacific, which was building east to west. Competition between the railroads, that is a, a nationally captivating story. It was who could get the furthest first 
you know, would have the most land uh, granted, the most per mile subsidies. So both companies realize that the more territory that their track controls, the more powerful their companies are going to be in the long run. The head of the Union Pacific Railroad was Thomas Durant. Thomas Durant was found out later to be a very corrupt businessman. The ringleader of the Central Pacific was California Governor Leland Stanford. Stanford would start in California and work east across the mountains. Durant would start in Omaha and build west across the Platte River Valley. Where the two would meet was anybody's guess. When you think about uh, no terminus being formally set for the railroads, so both railroads were just building flat out as far as they could go. Who can build the most and who can build the quickest? Stanford was at an immediate disadvantage. California at the time, in, in the 1860s, did not have a big industrial base. So all of the equipment, including the locomotives, had to be shipped out to the West Coast. Just a mind-boggling amount of spikes and rails uh, and ties to build just even one mile of track. Sacramento, California. Supplies weren't the only thing that was hard to come by. Governor Stanford had a hard time keeping men. They'd hire these big burly guys. But the problem in California is every single time that there was a gold rush, these guys would throw down their tools and walk off the job and go gold mining. But there was one group of men he could depend on. A lot of the Chinese laborers came to California for the gold rush. They were fleeing unrest, poverty in China. Work on the railroad was seen as very, very lucrative for the Chinese workers. These men would go on to become the backbone of the Central Pacific. Back east in Omaha, Nebraska, Durant was having no problem staffing up. You're going to have recently f uh, freed slaves. You're going to have uh, veterans from both sides of the Civil War, recent immigrants, Irish. You're going to have uh, people from all walks of life working for the Union Pacific. But Durant was desperately short on one vital supply. Not a lot of trees in the plains. He would need 2,300 wooden railroad ties for every mile of track. They'd set the rails at a uniform distance of 56 and a half inches apart. The rails would be held down by tie plates connected to the ties with steel spikes. But the local cottonwood was too soft for ties, so Durant had to buy oak from upriver. The railroad reached out to contractors. There were tie contractors up in the Dakotas and Montana that were sending, you know, logs down rivers. Pretty much anything they could find. What the valley lacked in timber, it made up in buffalo. You're talking about feeding. There's three to 400 men at the end of track. Plus, I mean, you had hundreds of other uh, uh, workers and employees. The buffalo harvest was good for food, but bad for relations with the locals. Very bad. The Lakota and the Cheyenne attacked railroad crews. 